No matter how much I make up, there's stuff in history that's just as bad or worse. Those are the words of George R. R. Martin, the writer of A Song of Ice and Fire, probably better known as Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is not unfamiliar with themes of violence, gore, sex, war and betrayal, and following those narrative themes is Fire and Blood, a novel that's a prequel to the events of A Song of Ice and Fire. This book inspired House of the Dragon, a show set nearly 200 years before the events of Game of Thrones. George R. R. Martin has built a vast and complex world with his novels, full of multifaceted characters, diverse societies and cultures, as well as their messy politics. At times, the events in these stories seem convoluted or impossible, but they have been plucked from various points in history and repackaged with more drama and fantasy. For me, it fulfills some of the same stuff with fantasies, takes us to another place, another time, a place where more raised. Yet in historical fiction, there's very attractive. Like how the Scottish betrayals at the Black Dinner and the massacre at Glencoe set the stage for the Red Wedding episode in Game of Thrones, or how the history of Old Valyria is partly based on the Roman Empire. House of the Dragon takes similar inspirations too, mainly from a period in English history called the Anarchy. Although George didn't confine himself to just England for this story. House of the Dragon begins in the time period of 112 AC, or after conquest, referring to the conquest of Aegon Targaryen I. In the year 101, Aegon's successor, King Jaehaerys, has no heir, so he holds a contest to choose the next ruler of Westeros. The two contenders were Princess Rhaenys Valyrian, his eldest granddaughter, and her younger cousin, Viserys. Viserys was chosen, and Rhaenys got the title of the Queen Who Never Was. But things weren't exactly smooth sailing for Viserys after succession, and that's when House of the Dragon picks up the story in 112 AC. These events mirror a two-decade-long period in English history following the death of King Henry I, who was the son of William the Conqueror. Henry I fathered over 20 illegitimate children, but with his wife, Queen Matilda, he had only two legitimate children, a daughter named Matilda, who would later be known as the Empress, and a son, William Adeline. The birth of William fulfilled the primary duty of a medieval queen, providing a male heir. Unfortunately, William, being the only male heir, made things risky for the line of succession. On the night of November 25th, 1120, William Adeline set sail from Barfleu, Normandy, to England with 300 other noblemen on board. A ship called the White Ship, which was newly refitted, was facing some delays, so the passengers and crew decided to pass the time by drinking heavily. As the ship set off, the intoxicated crew and passengers urged Captain Thomas Fitzstephen to overtake the king's ship, which had already departed some time ago. Fitzstephen agreed and the white ship struck a submerged rock and capsized. The priority, of course, was to save the future King William Adeline, but he quickly drowned with all the other passengers. The white ship disaster left King Henry I without an heir, but it also had political ramifications, because many of the noblemen on board were key figures in the English court. Their absence only destabilized the kingdom further. 
With a possible succession war on his hands, Henry I had to rush to produce another male heir, but fate wouldn't have it, because Queen Matilda died just two years later. And unfortunately, the king's later marriage to Adeliza of Louvain wouldn't produce any children either. As he grew older and his time drew closer, he decided to name his daughter and only legitimate child, Matilda, the queen. This was, of course, unprecedented in medieval English society. Queens were only influential for the short time their husbands were away and their sons were still young. Her power would only come from marriage and childbirth, not direct rule. And that's pretty much the conflict in the show too. House of the Dragon opens up with a scene that mentions a preference for a male heir. And Rhaenys just has to accept this as the order of things. But once Viserys becomes king, he faces a very similar situation to Henry I. His wife, Queen Aemma, suffers multiple stillbirths and miscarriages. So he's left with only one daughter, Rhaenyra. With no male heir, Viserys designates his younger brother, Daemon, as his successor. But when Daemon's behavior becomes intolerable, Viserys disinherits and banishes him. Left with only his daughter, Viserys decides to name her as his successor. Both Henry I and Viserys face the challenge of convincing their noblemen to overcome their prejudices and support a female ruler. Henry I took measures to make his daughter Matilda more acceptable to them. After Matilda returned to England as a widow in 1125, Henry persuaded his barons two years later in 1127 to swear their allegiance for her as his successor. He also arranged for her to marry a second time to ensure the birth of a male heir, essentially doing whatever possible to secure her place on the throne. But that was hardly the end of the story, both in reality and fiction. After Matilda's marriage to Geoffrey Plantagenet, Count of Anjou, the barons were again summoned to renew their oaths to her in 1131. Two years later, in 1133, Matilda gave birth to a son, also called Henry, followed by another pledge of loyalty from the barons. Her father, Henry I, would die two years later, and no sooner was he buried than Matilda's rule was challenged by her very own cousin, Henry I's nephew, Stephen of Blois, staked claim to the throne backed up by the noblemen who had pledged their loyalty to Matilda. Matilda was overthrown and Stephen had his coronation as king in 1135. But Matilda did still have her own support. Her half-brother Robert, Earl of Gloucester, her husband Geoffrey, Count of Anjou, and various other nobles unhappy with Stephen's reign along with opportunists, backed her claim. Viserys entertains a plethora of suitors for Rhaenyra to marry to secure her claim through having a son, and the nobles of Westeros swear loyalty to Rhaenyra as the royal successor. Unfortunately, Rhaenyra and her husband never consummate the marriage, and she ends up having three sons with a lover, probably Sir Harwin Strong. So now, Rhaenyra is already in a risky position, but to add to her troubles, her father Viserys remarries to Alicent Hightower, bearing him a son, Aegon II. With a male heir established, the noblemen who pledged allegiance to Rhaenyra shifted to support Aegon II as the heir. Both of these queens, robbed of their legacy, now stood to fight. The Empress Matilda's forces invaded England in 1139, helped by her husband and her uncle, King David of Scotland. But it was a fight nobody was prepared for. Both Stephen and Matilda made huge compromises to gain support from barons, allowing these barons to acquire new land, 
castles, and greater control over local affairs. For a long time, things remained bleak and hopeless, as the royals tore each other apart, until the Battle of Lincoln in 1141. Robert of Gloucester captured Stephen and shifted the power to Empress Matilda, giving her control. But even that advantage didn't last long as Matilda got cocky. And when her arrogance lost her supporters, her position was weakened and Stephen was able to take over again. A year later, in 1142, in the Siege of Oxford, Stephen charged into Oxford Castle, where Matilda was hiding. And she managed to escape by running across the frozen Thames River. Eleven years later, and there was still no conclusion to the fight. It was a game of cat and mouse, and everybody was losing. But during a standoff moment at Wallingford Castle, William d'Aubigny, the first Earl of Arundel, spoke up, tired and angered by the futility of this war. This led to a temporary ceasefire in 1153, and the truce that followed became the Treaty of Wallingford. It basically established that Stephen would be allowed to stay king, but after his death, Matilda's son, Henry Plantagenet of Anjou, would take over. But that would be the case only if both parties agreed to end the war and work on actually improving the state of the country. Stephen, though, wouldn't stay around long enough to fix the damage. He died a year later in 1154, allowing Henry to ascend the throne as Henry II at the age of 21. His rule began a period of reconstruction and reconsolidation of royal authority, which was lost during the two decade long fight between his mother and his uncle. And for the fictional Matilda, Renera. The circumstances of her future were a little different. The anarchy, after all, only serves as a foundation for the events of House of the Dragon. It also serves as a way to enrich the backgrounds of the main characters, which relies heavily on inspiration from real events in history. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something new about this series and the story it was inspired from. If you haven't already, do me a favor and subscribe to the channel for more content like this, and I'll see you in the next one.